I'm going to start broadly today talking about race and, and difference in general in American political culture in a way that I hope gives you a foundation for thinking about immigration specifically, but also might be a way to, to tie together some of the themes um, uh, from the entire week uh, that, that, you're, that you're managing. Um, there's a story, it's probably not true, but it's, but it's funny of a, uh, an older Russian Jewish woman uh, disembarking at Ellis Island and uh, fresh off the boat, faced with the stern Ellis Island official bureaucrat staring over his desk at her and asking uh, in, in almost menacing tones um, as a way of testing her, and this was, was part of that initial confrontation for many people, would you ever subvert or overthrow this government by force or subversion? And she thought it over for a minute and said, subversion. <laughs> we have a really ambivalent relationship, uh, as our headlines every day will tell us, to the notion of immigration. We like to, there's a kind of romance we like the story of being so choice-worthy that the world's peoples have always wanted to come here. Uh, we've also, uh, in general, pick any period, basically, from the, the, the late 18th century onward, uh, we've always had this sneaking suspicion that the people who are coming ashore are about to ruin the country in one way or another. And those two things live very un uneasily side by side in American political culture. So today I want to start by thinking about diversity in general and the way that the political culture manages that. Um, and it, it, this will give us a way to think about the history of European immigration, which I'll, I'll go into later in this morning session. Um, but as I said, it will also give us a way to think about things that, in fact, we're often not encouraged to think about at the same time. Like, for example, immigration, slavery, conquest, the various ways that, that the peoples of North America have ended up here. So let me just start with a thumbnail sketch. I'm gonna, and, and, um, this is something that you already know, and I'm going to make it short and just brief, but just to remind you, and also, and I do this because um, in our own classrooms, both as students and now as teachers, I think we're, we often um, carve these, these uh, histories off in, and don't think of them together. Um, so the, the question is, you know, the peopling of North America, who's here, how did they get here? So as you know, and as you've covered earlier in the week, we start with the native nations. Uh, hundreds, scores, hundreds of, of distinct societies with their distinct religions, their distinct languages, their distinct histories um, scattered uh, across the continent. Um, the Cherokees in what's now the Southeast, the Iroquois, the Great Iroquois Nation in what's now uh, New York and Lower Canada, uh, uh, the Snoqualmies in, in the uh, Pacific Northwest, and you could go on and on, and there are hundreds, right? Those populations are soon joined by arriving Europeans, and especially the nodes of three distinct empires, and four if you want to count the Dutch. But the principal ones, and the ones who, who wielded the most power over time, uh, the, British, the British Empire in what's now the Northeast and the Eastern Seaboard, uh, the French Empire uh, in what's now Canada and all the way across to the great French city of Detroit, um, which is now the upper Midwest, and down the Mississippi through the, the center of the continent uh, to uh, New Orleans. And the Spanish Empire, both in what's now the, the U.S. Southeast and the Southwest. As you know, some of those European arrivals brought with them slaves from Africa or, or began importing slaves from Africa. So then again, whole new population introduced, and again, on very different terms than either of the, the two populations that I've discussed so far. Then, as the, the British Empire begins to win the day, uh, and, and British political culture uh, begins to, to be the predominant political culture on the continent, you have the, the westward expansion uh, and an Anglo uh, uh, political culture that, that uh, gradually uh, moves across the continent. And so um, more and more populations brought in through histories of conquest and inclusion um, and dispossession often 
as well, including you know, the, the huge populations, indigenous populations and former uh, Mexican uh, populations of what's now the, the Southwest and the Far West uh, in the United States. Then you have varying degrees of voluntary migration beginning mostly from Europe. Uh, people coming in uh, as indentured servants um, and also people coming in in, in much greater uh, varieties of freedom or total liberty, but no nonetheless voluntary migrants um, who come in the greatest numbers. And the first massive wave is really the Irish, um, although there had obviously been a lot of, of European immigrants before the, the massive wave of the Irish. Uh, and then increasingly coming from other, other parts of Europe and increasingly further south and further east in Europe as you get deeper into the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century. And then, finally, one last group of voluntary migrants, but voluntary migrants who come in on very different terms than the Europeans, and that is uh, Asian immigrants. First from China in the mid-century, followed by the Japanese, and immigrants from, uh, from uh, South and East Asia. And I say coming in on different terms, and this is something I'll get into in more detail in a minute. For the most part, these were voluntary migrants as well, but they were not eligible to become citizens in the way that European immigrants were. In fact, they were completely ineligible for citizenship, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. Okay, this, this you all know. You know that these people are here. What we tend not to think about so much, we talk about diversity, we talk about distinct religions or cultures or languages, we don't tend to talk so much about the diversity of standing. How did people get here? What is their legal standing in what became the United States? What is their relationship? What is our relationship to the idea of America, to uh, America as a state, to America as a nation, to America as, uh, as a, a country with, with uh, not just a history, but a history of histories in collision, as one, as one historian has said. So you look at this panoply of peoples in North America, and the question is, how do you create a democracy, a true democracy, out of these histories in collision? If you're the founding generation, the way you do it is by beginning very, 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 very gradually, and gradually, especially by 21st century standards. So one of the first thoughtful, detailed, in-depth discussions of citizenship that took place is the first Congress that sat down, this is 1790, when they sat down to talk about, okay, who's allowed to come to the United States? And, and how can they become citizens? What's the first naturalization law going to look like? The main, the most important clause in that law was free white persons. Only free white persons could come and become naturalized citizens in the new nation. Now this is a law that was in effect and on the books all the way from 1790, if you have to imagine I have a big timeline behind me because that's because I'm going to imagine that and I know it's not true, but <laughs> okay. That's a law that goes on the books in 1790, the first time Congress discusses it. Does anyone know how long the free white persons clause is on the books? That's a great guess. It, it goes, it's, it's, it's uh, revised out in 1952. Okay, that's a very long time. My parents were married in 1950. <laughs> so, um, now there were some additions to it. After the Civil War, they added the phrase um, persons of African nativity and descent. And, uh, and then uh, around World War II, uh, because the Chinese were our allies, they added a clause specifying uh, that, that Chinese nationals could become citizens. Um, but the, that, the white person's clause was the foundation of immigration law through that whole period. Uh, and then, as you said, uh, the, the more major and kind of liberalizing shift in, in uh, immigration policy was articulated by a law in 1965 that we can talk about later. Now this, in some ways, is the most portentous law in American history, at least the history of American citizenship. And portentous both in two senses. Portentous in what it meant for ensuing history, portentous also for what it tells us 
about our political culture. So let me go into both of those aspects of it. Portentous and what it meant for ensuing history. Uh, let's talk about the legacies of the 1790 law, which stretch on into the 19th and, and indeed the 20th centuries. One legacy is what we, we think of as Ellis Island immigration in general. The entire history of European immigration unfolds on the foundation of the Free White Persons Clause in 1790. Um, European immigration um, becomes less and less English over time. In the English colonies, uh, European immigration is almost entirely English uh, in the 17th century. Significantly less English, in fact, predominantly non-English uh, by the 18th century, uh, including um, predominantly uh, Germans, for example, and Dutch. Uh, and then by the time you get into the 19th century, it's becoming more and more diverse. The, the migration from Europe is becoming more and more diverse, so that by the end of the century, uh, Russian Jews, Italians, Greeks, uh, Yugoslavs, I mean, all of these peoples of Europe who the framers never had in mind when they said free white persons, they were really were kind of thinking about the English, but all of these people came in on the coattails of the Free White Persons Clause. So anyone in this room who traces their family history through Ellis Island or some version of Ellis Island, uh, whether it's Castle Garden before Ellis Island was built or the uh, Great Port of Galveston or Baltimore or some of the other uh, points of arrival, uh, our family histories are one of the legacies of the Free White Persons Clause. Uh, second legacy, and to, to think about the power of that law over time, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which is enacted in the 1880s and then renewed every decade uh, through the early 20th century, which, which said basically, not only can you not be citizens because you're not free white persons, but you can't come here anymore. You can't even be here. No more Chinese. That law passes, it, the agitation for it begins primarily in the West, although um, we Easterners flatter ourselves by thinking that it wasn't part of the, the history of the East also. But the agitation against the Chinese catches on and it's able to really rule American political culture in the, those election cycles of the 1880s precisely because the population being talked about, the Chinese, didn't have the rights of, of citizenship to begin with. They were allowed to be here as laborers, but because of the Free White Persons Clause, they could not be citizens, and they weren't. And therefore, there were no politicians on the scene who were beholden to Chinese voters. There was no court of law in which uh, Chinese uh, witnesses or, or uh, others who might give testimony had any weight at all. And so their rights were really just steamrolled. And so that's, that happens in the 1880s, 90s, uh, turn of the 20th century, but that's a direct legacy of the fr uh, Free White Persons Clause of 1790. And then tracing that, that out even further during World War II, the internment of Japanese Americans and the Japanese immigrant by, uh, generation, that too is built directly on the foundation of the Free White Persons Clause of 1790. And it's the same thing. Um, because uh, the, the migrating generation of Japanese immigrants uh, were not citizens, they continued to have a very different relationship to their homeland than other immigrant groups did, for one thing. Um, not that they were loyal to Japan and not loyal to the U.S., that was never proven in any single case, but, that, uh, but they did have a very different relationship to the idea of Japan. And many of them, when faced with the question, will you forswear your allegiance to the emperor of Japan, were in a quandary because they were being asked that by a government that didn't recognize them as anyone with rights. So to, to, to say that they would forswear their allegiance to Japan, even if they felt no allegiance, was kind of a, a political, uh, it, was a, it was a trap. Or at least it was perceived that way. You know, so one reason why the, the Japanese uh, were interned and German and Italian Americans were not. I mean, there are, there are reasons that have to do with the culture of race and racism and racialism and, and racial ways of seeing, but there's also a very particular legal history. Italian Americans and German Americans were citizens and had all of the rights and protections that citizens had. So there were some Germans and Italians who were interned, but in every case they were people who were discovered to have p very particular ties to subversive groups um, through good old-fashioned police work. It wasn't presumed that the entire population uh, 
that the entire population was, was guilty of anything and needed to be interned, nor could that ever have become the kind of, of, the kind of popular, um, the kind of popular uh, sentiment that it did in the case of the Japanese. Because again, there was no politician uh, on the scene in the US who was beholden to the, uh, Japanese immigrants as, uh, as, a, as a block of voters. Okay, so those are the legacies. That's one meaning of you know, the portent of that law in 1790. The second meaning is what does it tell us about our political culture? What, what does that law in 1790 reveal about the relationship between race on the one hand and citizenship on the other? Now, that the debate on that law is fascinating. And there isn't a word-for-word -word transcript, but there are accounts of that debate in 1790. And they debated everything about that law. Who, who should be able to come and who should be able to become a citizen? Catholics? Jews? Or do you need to be Protestant? People who hold property in foreign lands? People who have been aristocrats in foreign lands? Nobles from foreign lands? Do you need to have someone testify uh, on, on, on your behalf to say that you're a worthy, a worthy citizen. They talked about, and they talked about this endlessly, debated every, every which way, you know, who could and who could not become a citizen. The white person's clause never came up for discussion. It just was so foundational to the thinking that it just went from pre-thought to page and into law without any congressional discussion at all. Now, why is that? First of all, it, it came out of colonial statutory law in a really organic and simple way. Um, there were uh, colonial statutes on the books that used the word white or the idea of white persons for various things. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is the very practical reason of, now go back to that mosaic of peoples that I, I introduced at the beginning. If you're, if you're um, kind of trying to build a polity um, in, the, in the setting of Indian wars on the one hand and slaveholding on the other, um, ideas like uh, domestic tranquility become kind of racialized ideas because the, the, the greatest threats to domestic tranquility are Indian wars and slave revolts. So the idea of who can carry a gun, for example, or who can be part of the militia uh, in many of the colonies, of course, would be whites only. Of course, white persons would be the people who are, who are being discussed as participants in the polity in that level. So at one level, the idea of, of free white persons becoming citizens and, and the only uh, people who could become citizens, um, that, that was not just uh, derived from practice itself, but for very practical reasons in the setting of, of um, what we should think of as not just a simple democracy, but, but a settler democracy. That is a democracy that's being built on behalf of settlers uh, when there are other populations on, on the ground who are going to hold different standing. The other is more philosophical, but closely related. It's not, it's not just that in practice, citizenship seemed to many in those, those uh, European or Euro-American generations, uh, whiteness seemed to be a, a requisite for citizenship. But philosophically, the idea of democracy seemed to depend on something that only Europeans seemed to possess. The radicalism of the revolution was that it removed the powers of the crown and completely reorganized the lines of political authority so that authority is not running from the crown downward to the people in hierarchical fashion, but now people are going to be self-governing and all lines of authority are going to be more or less horizontal. The idea at the time, and this was articulated um, very overtly, was that this wildly experimental project in the history of, of governance was going to require a very special population. It was going to require a population that was going to be virtuous, far-seeing, forbearant, you know, all kinds of, of virtues 
Um, if this experiment was going to work, the population was going to have to be very special. And in the context of European discussion and Euro-American discussion, all of these virtues were silently, tacitly, but very powerfully raced as white. There's civilization and there's barbarism. There's heathendom and there's Christianity. However you want to phrase it, and you'll see this written in, in kind of, or articulated in different ways at different times in the, in the late 18th century, but in all cases, there's this presumption that, that only um, white persons possess the thing that is needed for this very rickety, dangerous experiment in politics to work, which is one of the reasons why even among abolitionists, uh, white abolitionists, uh, around uh, the revolution and, and, and for two generations after, even among abolitionists, you'll find people basically saying, slavery is wrong, the slaves should be free, but freed, freed slaves should not stay here. And that's a very powerful presumption in the history of abolitionist thought uh, in, in those, those first generations. And it, it, it sprouts from this same uh, constellation of ideas about the world's peoples and who's capable of what, and who's not capable of what, and who deserves what, and, and who can be welcomed in to this, this very uh, daring political experiment in self-government, where, where uh, authority is being organized in, uh, in a different way and along different lines. Okay, so let me just say a few things about what's at stake in thinking about our history in this way. The first is that we can realize the inadequacy of some of our favored metaphors for thinking about diversity. The two most famous ones are the melting pot on the one hand and either the mosaic or the potato salad or you know, whatever it is on the other, right? But there's assimilationism, there's pluralism. Very different models and very different ways of thinking of, of how peoples come together and interact. Right? In the one model, we all kind of go into the pot, a kind of uniformity is created, we become each other in a way. You go into the pot one thing, you come out another thing. We're all Americans, we're melted down, right? In the other model, no, 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 the potato doesn't become celery, <laughs> right? You know, the tomato doesn't become anything but what it is, it's a tomato, but boy, doesn't it all taste great together when you put it in there, right? That's how American diversity works. As different as those models are, as sociological models of thinking about how, how populations come together, the one thing they have in common, and probably the most important thing about either of them, is that they, there's no room in either of those metaphors for thinking about power relations and the differential power relations that are involved in the making of the American population. You know, what if some of the items that went into the salad didn't really go there by choice? What if some of the items that went into the salad had rights that other items didn't? You know, there's no way to really talk about that in an elegant way if we're talking about melting pots and potato salads. So, again, just to, to really push this forward to the forefront, you know, when we're talking about diversity, we're not just talking about difference in terms of language, religion, history, uh, culture, subculture, all of these things, we're talking about very differential legal histories, different, differential histories of standing before the law, of standing under the law, of standing in the court of law. And that's a dimension of diversity that, that we need to, to keep in mind if we're going to understand the rest of it, if we're going to understand uh, diversity in terms of languages, religions, and the like. For example, you know, if we're going to really understand the battles over English only, it's really important to know that on one side of the debate, you have people who came into the, who came into the polity by conquest and force and not by choice and whose treaties guaranteed them that they wouldn't have to learn English. And on the other side of the debate, you have, for the most part, people who think of American history as on the European model, voluntary, uh, you know, where a kind of assimilationism is much, is much easier to imagine, or at least your relationship to it is different. Okay, a second thing that's at stake, at stake in thinking about uh, our history in this way is that we can see uh, a kind of genealogy of identity politics that's really important. We tend to think of identity politics as a distinctly post-civil rights phenomenon. Um, 
I mean, that's when the phrase identity politics even begins to appear and ideas of multiculturalism and all of these things. Um, but in fact, identity politics has a much longer history necessarily. I mean, the 1790 naturalization law, free white persons, is identity politics par excellence. And, and everything that kind of followed after that and all of the struggles for inclusion um, are, a, are, are kind of represent forms of identity politics that are, are directly uh, spurred by and also informed and shaped by that, uh, that, additional, that an initial pronouncement that, that um, whiteness and citizenship would be so, uh, so intertwined. Another thing to notice here then is that identity politics as it has unfolded, whether we're talking about uh, the basis for inclusion of Native Americans in the 19th and early 20th century, whether we're talking about uh, the inclusion of, of African Americans in the, in the wake of emancipation, or whether we're talking about various immigrant groups, identity politics is structured. There's a, there's a way that the discussion is already patterned by this initial pronouncement that there's a we the people who represents the rightful inheritors of the country and then there are these other people on the outside. There's the inner circle of we the people and the outer circle of, of the others and the circle indeed has widened and widened and widened over time through, through struggle and often violent struggle but it has widened to the extent that by the 21st century that initial circle looks pretty tiny to us. Free white persons, <laughs> male property holders, um, but those discussions have been, have been patterned all along the way. So the, the, the choice that people who have been defined out of we the people from the start, the, the basic choice they've been posed is either A, we can make the case for our inclusion by claiming to be the same as the people who are inside, right? We are being maligned and, and uh, slandered. You misunderstand us. If you think that we're so different that we can't be among we the people, we're here to prove you wrong. Give us the chance and we will prove you wrong. We are just like you. The other argument is, you know, you're, you're right about our difference, but you're wrong about our worth. We, we, let us in and you'll see that though we are different from you, we have very special gifts to give and the Republic will be enriched by our presence and our contribution. Those are the two basic choices, the kind of argument from sameness and argument from difference. And that is a political argument you will see again and again and again and again in American history in different settings. I don't know if it came up yesterday, that's one of the basic patterns of American feminism. Whether you're talking about the 1920s or the 1970s. Women should have all the rights of men because women are the same as men. Women should have the rights of men because women are so different from the men that they have a different kind of moral compass that will actually enrich political life. It's the Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois debate in African American history. And it's the basic citizenship debate in every immigrant group I know anything about, whether it's Russian Jews at the turn of the century, Koreans in the 1980s, the debate of you know, wh uh, what are the terms by which we are going to claim that we should be on an equal footing with everyone else. And that's, you know, identity politics don't unfold along those lines in any old place. I mean, look at Turks in Germany or guest workers in, in uh, what have become um, uh, the, the, the new kind of receiving countries uh, in, given the new patterns of migration. Um, you'll see that discussion unfolding in very different ways. In the United States, in this setting, it tends to be defined by those choices. The argument from sameness and the argument from difference. The other thing that's at stake, and maybe the most important thing of all that's at stake in thinking about our diverse histories and collision in these terms, is that what I'm suggesting here is that we need to rethink the relationship between racism and democracy. When I was in school, I was taught to think, and I, can, you know, I, have, I have kids who are now teenagers, and I can vouch for the fact that they have been taught to think, and I don't think this is so uncommon, 
that when you're talking about American history and American political history, you basically have the story of democracy over here, which is the biggest game in town and the most important thing. This is our contribution to world history, American democracy. By the way, over here, there's this little thing called racism that is really unfortunate and it's really bad and we should really try to get rid of it and it's a blot, but trust me, it's over here, right? Here's democracy, racism is over here. Looking back at the 1790 law and the debates around it and the meaning that it took on and the meaning, the meaning that it held for the framers at the time, what's that suggesting is actually not only is, is race and racism not over here, removed from democracy. But at the time, racism was the guarantor of democracy. The experiment was going to work because it was protected by the exclusions that were articulated through race and by racism. It would work because even the, the, the relatively few Africans who were freedmen at the revolution were excluded politically in one way or another, either by state law, by local ordinance, or whatever. The, the native nations, regardless of, of what uh, the particular arrangement was between the nation and the tribe in any given case, for the most part, held, uh, were held kind of at arm's length by uh, the, the structures of governance in, in, the new, uh, in the new republic. And, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act is, is just a kind of a dramatic rearticulation of exactly that principle uh, a century later. So, um, it's not the case that racism and democracy are, are separate in some way, but in fact, they're almost like one of those figure and ground puzzles. You know, you look at it one way and it looks like a vase, and you look at it another way and it's, and it's two faces facing each other. Racism and democracy, and this isn't, there's nothing necessary about this, but in this history, in this political setting, in North America since 1790, or, or before, actually, Racism and democracy have configured each other in certain ways, and that's one of the reasons why racism has been so difficult to root out, I think, because it, it lies so closely to the heart of American political culture. So then another thing that's at stake in thinking about this is, and especially when we're trying to teach about these things in the classroom, you know, we are basically taught to think that Thomas Jefferson was a great, a great person for his country and Martin Luther King was a great person for his people. Now, both things may be true, but I think we also are encouraged by this model to think about Thomas Jefferson was actually also a great person for his people and Martin Luther King was a great person for his country, right? If we think about democracy always as an imperfect work in progress and one that's, that's always kind of contending with uh, the racism that's, that's at its heart, um, it's not just a kind of add-on history where you have the, 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 the pantheon of American great thinkers like Thomas Jefferson and then, you know, kind of add-ons later. It's more that, that they're joint architects in, in a history that's always being kind of reworked and refashioned and, and rebuilt. Okay, so that's, that's all kind of foundational. Uh, for thinking about the relationship between immigration and, and other topics uh, in American history when it comes to uh, the, the, the overall diversity of this polit political culture. Um, but it also gives us a different way of thinking about the history then of European immigration. Because in general, I mean, people will talk about Asian immigrants as the so-called model minority in the US. But when you get right down to it, European immigrants are really the model minority. I mean, that's the model that we like. You come here by choice. You may, maybe you start in a ghetto, and maybe there's some discrimination against you. But you kind of, that changes over time. And you end up in a different place. And you're included. And the story is pretty happy. Um, that, that is the story of citizenship and inclusion that is really based um, tacitly on the European immigrant model. And, and we're not really encouraged to think much about what race had to do with that. So I want to talk about European immigration through the prism of race first. Um, that will finish out this, 
uh, this session this morning, and then, and then later we'll talk about some of the other aspects of European immigration um, in, in the terms that, that this week has been founded on, which is uh, the kind of struggles for equality theme. Okay. So if we're taking the, Im the immigration or the, the naturalization law of 1790 as a starting point for thinking about the history of immigration, there are three major periods of migration that kind of unfold. The first is that initial period following the migration of 17, or the, the law of 1790. The, the first arrivals of, of Europeans who, began, who, who started to come in increasing numbers uh, as those free white persons of naturalization law. As I said, uh, European immigration is becoming less and less English over time. Uh, by the time of the revolutionary generation and the, the first part of the 19th century, you're already beginning to get um, higher numbers of, of Irish, for example, um, and not just Irish Protestants, although initially the numbers there were higher, um, but, but some Irish Catholics as well. And it's not until really the famine that, you, that suddenly there's an explosion and, and you get huge numbers. But in this initial period, the free white persons who are coming are not coming in enormous, massive, huge numbers, for one thing. And they're also coming more or less from the predicted parts of Europe. The, they, the people who are coming ashore are not people who are really taking by surprise the people who, who penned uh, the Free White Persons Clause. It's mostly people from Western and Northern Europe uh, and, and from what we think of as the UK, uh, especially. So let's think of that period from the articulation of the law in 1790 to uh, really the beginnings of the famine migration in the 1840s as the first period of, of European migration, numbers are pretty low, and, and most importantly, uh, the idea of free white persons is pretty untroubled. There's nothing going on that's really shaking up that notion. That's going to change dramatically, beginning with the famine migration from Ireland in the 1840s, and then on through the balance of the 19th century, all the way until uh, the legislation of 1924 really changes the rules and, and reduces the numbers of migrants, which we'll talk about uh, in more detail. But suddenly in that period, beginning with the Irish, not only are you getting people coming in numbers that were just undreamed a generation earlier, but they're beginning to come from places that were undreamed as well. So they're still coming in under the, the rubric of the free white persons clause. But increasingly, they are not exactly the people that the framers had in mind when they said it would be a simple matter for free white persons to, to come ashore and become citizens. So first, it's the Irish, and not just by the thousands or tens of thousands or by hundreds of thousands, but ultimately by the millions. And then Germans and Scandinavians. And then again, as the century uh, progresses on towards the, the latter, the, uh, the latter um, quarter or so of the century and on into the 20th century, people from deeper and deeper into the east and south of, of Europe, Russian Jews, Italians, Greeks, Slavs, Poles. And in this period, which I'm going to date, and again, putting dates on these kinds of things is difficult because obviously these are not like so cut and dried, but in a general way, the period from the 1840s to the passage of that law in 1924, which rearticulates who's allowed to come in and, and uh, at, at what rate. So that from the 1840s to 1924 is a period of massive European immigration, and it's a period when the idea of free white persons becomes very troubled indeed, and it begins to fracture. And what you start to see more and more is not notions of a hierarchy of white races, not a unified, simply articulated white race, but myriad white races. In some schemes, there were as many as 37 races of Europe. In some schemes, there were five. In some schemes, there were three. But in all of these schemes, there was a hierarchy. For the, in general, Western and Northern Europeans at the top of that hierarchy, Southern and Eastern Europeans at the bottom. And it might be articulated as Nordics you know, versus Mediterraneans, or it might be articulated as you know, Anglo-Saxons, Celts, Slavs, Hebrews, uh, Mediterraneans, Greco, 
Ouvrians. I mean, it, some of these schemes get quite elaborate. But the principle is that the, the notion of a unified white population is no longer working. It's not working to explain who we're seeing, and it's not working in terms of kind of protecting this still, what is the notion of a kind of a delicate experiment in democracy. These Hebrews and Italians are going to ruin this democracy. Just take a look at them, right? And people start scouting race in very different ways. And, and one of the things, one of the tricks from the standpoint of the late 20th or, or early 21st century is to realize in these contexts, as these debates are going on, when they said race, they meant race. When they were talking about Celts or Slavs or Hebrews, they meant people with inherited biological characteristics rooted in the blood, passed on biologically. I mean, all of these things, which also now we know are not true in, in, in any sense. But my point is that they meant racial difference the same way they meant racial difference when they were talking about white and black or white and Asian. They meant a parcel of traits that were immutable and that were carried in the blood. And so when they talked about their hierarchies, um, from Anglo-Saxon at the top to you know, Mediterranean at the bottom, they were also talking uh, in terms that were, were meant to articulate a way of excluding peoples who now were wrongly getting in under the free white person's clause. And then the final, the final period then is post-1924. In 1924, the most restrictive and in some ways most important uh, immigration law is passed. And it specifically adopts, now it's called the National Origins Quotas, but if you look at the congressional debates and you look at all of the popular literature at the time and, and newspaper editorials and opinion and just in general discussion, clearly they were not talking about national origin, they were talking about race. They were talking about the races of Europe and which ones were desirable and which ones were undesirable and how they could keep out the people's that they didn't want. And the, the formula they came up with in 1924, they went back several census counts. They went all the way back to, to 1890, when the numbers of the, um, the, the so-called undesirable peoples were still pretty small. And they used that census as the baseline for, for working out the formulas of how many people could come from each part of the world. The law in 1924 then virtually excludes um, Asian immigrants entirely. Um, it, it, in a sense, it extends the Chinese Exclusion Act to the rest of, of Asia. And it just truncates uh, the waves of migration from Europe in exactly the ways that correspond with, with those hierarchies of race that I was talking about. So it's still, the 1924 law still allows uh, a, a fair number of Western and Northern Europeans and, and shuts down the, uh, the migration from places like um, Italy or Greece or Russia to almost nothing. Not entirely nothing, but almost nothing. There's a question over here. When I'm teaching this in class, uh, the quota acts during the 1920s, a lot of times I tie it to the Red Scare and mm -hmm. the communism. Are you saying that it was mostly about racism? Well, I think that, um, that it's layered. And I think it meant different things to different people. I think that there were people um, who cared more about things like literacy. There were people who cared more about radicalism and politics. But the foundation of the entire debate, I think, goes all the way back to 1790 and the presumptions of fitness for, for government. And that, that, language, um, that language gets stronger and stronger as the debate as the debate goes on. So in, in some sense, um, the, the, the history of race and race thinking that I'm talking about, you're right, is kind of one element of many. But I'm saying that it's a core element whose, whose, whose roots um, go, go very deeply into uh, American history, starting with the presumptions of 1790, and then starting increasingly, and, and in a minute I'll, I'll, I'll go through the specific history of this more and more. But even, you know, the Irish, uh, the, the first charge against the Irish is that they're Papists and that because they're Catholics they can't be good citizens. But it's pretty quick. I mean, it's as early as the late 1850s that you're starting to hear racialized arguments about the unfitness of the Irish. And that, that um, there's a kind of Irish package of traits that are a bad bet for the Republic. And that, and that kind of, of uh, 
thinking uh, just accelerates over the course of the century, and it's, um, it's increasingly um, given more and more authority by the disciplines. Um, anthropology um, becomes really a bastion for that kind of racialized thinking. The biological sciences, early psychiatry, I mean, more and more. So that by the time, you know, the debates, in some sense, the debates that end up with the 1924 Act, that series of debates starts uh, in the 1890s and it goes on for you know more than 20 years and those debates draw more and more heavily from the biological sciences and the various disciplines that are articulating race as as an important factor in human history um, so that um, so that by 1924 um, the, the formula that's used while some people might be jumping on board um, for reasons that have more to do with radicalism or I mean, some people have said that the, the, uh, the coalition that finally backs immigration restriction in 1924, it only comes together because of changes in the economy and that capitalism is, is entering a new phase and so the, the mass of unskilled workers is no longer as necessary as it, as it had been before. So business is getting on board in a certain way. African Americans uh, are, are migrating from south to north into the to urban centers, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, but that uh, is providing a, a kind of workforce that, that is easing some of the needs of industry and, and business in the north. And so the coalition is, is changing for reasons that, that are, are distinct from this history of racial thinking that I'm talking about. But the history of racial thinking is the thing that's giving shape to the debate over citizenship and who should be in and who should be out. And it's the thing that, that is cast as law in the, in, the national origins, uh, in the national origins law. And so then, and we can talk about this, this more in a minute, and I have some images to show you that kind of get at this history. But then the 1924 law um, opens the, the, the third great period, I would say, of European immigration. Uh, and the status of Europeans in the U.S. And that you, we can give it the shorthand is that it's a period of reconsolidation of whiteness. In part because the immigration law itself, and I'm going to put this in quotes, but it, it solved the immigration problem, right, by shutting down immigration so drastically. So what was at stake in the racial difference among Europeans uh, became less and less over time since not... You know, millions of them aren't arriving every day. Um, but also, again, to go back to the, the great migration of African Americans from south to north, that really changed the racial alchemy of exactly the cities that most of the European immigrants had arrived in in the first place. So as, as uh, uh, African Americans move from not only the rural south, but also the urban south to the, the urban north, uh, and move into cities like Philadelphia, Boston, New York, Chicago. Um, the, the, the racial politics of those places uh, is changing really rapidly. So in a sense, you could say that it was the European groups, right? It was the, the European pariahs of the 19th century, the Celts, the Slavs, the Hebrews, were in some sense the first beneficiaries of the African-American migration. Because in 1877, the biggest racial chasm in a city like Boston was Anglo-Saxons on the one hand and Celts on the other. By 1925, the biggest racial chasm in Boston was white and black. And there's a kind of reconsolidation and re-racialization or reconfiguration of the European populations uh, who are now on the ground in the US. To the extent that by 1960, one of those despised Europeans is elected president, John F. Kennedy. By 1965, he's passing, well, he, not him anymore, but um, his, his predecessor, or his uh, successor, uh, LBJ, is passing uh, a liberalized immigration law whose dream is to reopen the gates from Europe. That's not what happens at all, and we can talk about that more, too, the unintended consequences of 1965. But if you look at those debates, the 1965 law, the people that the, the, the uh, they had in mind really were the uncles and aunts and brothers and cousins who had been left behind in places like Ireland and Greece and Italy. Uh, and again, no longer talked about as the problematic races of Europe, but just as our brothers and cousins and aunts. And that's who Americans had become. Okay, let me look um, at a couple of 
images. Okay, this is a cartoon from Harper's Weekly in 1876 talking about potential voters and what it will mean to have them included in the polity. And what you have, obviously, two heavily racialized, almost bestial images. Um, the f newly freed slave on the right, uh, the newly arrived Irish, Im or on, on your right the, is the newly arrived Irish immigrant, on your left is the newly freed slave, uh, weighing identically in the scales of civic <coughs> potential. Um, and while it's important, now this is one of the things that's tricky about teaching this history because we have to keep two things in our head at the same time and they're contradictory, but it's the contradiction itself that shapes the history. One is that all of these immigrants I'm talking about from Europe were privileged in the sense that they came in as free white persons, even if their fitness for self-government was debated and hotly debated, and even if, there were, uh, even if they were despised, even if they were pariahs, and even if there were attempts to block them for coming or even to strip them from rights. There was a, a point in where the, the Louisiana legislature actually debated whether Italians were in fact white and, and tried to strip them of their citizenship, but that didn't go through. Um, but so even amid all of these debates over their, their civic worth or their potential or their value as people or peoples, um, there's a kind of bedrock privilege of rights based on the fact that they are free white persons um, by law. The other thing that we can't forget, though, and that is important to hold in our heads, is how despised they were and how, how tenuous at times uh, their hold on, on whiteness itself uh, was. Whoops. Here's, uh, this is an image from the 1850s depicting, and it's interesting, I mean, and this is, this is common, um, depicting the, the ragtag um, Irish pauper uh, just setting sail for New York uh, and, then, and then returning um, successfully. And, what, and now look at, look at just the way the figure is drawn, the color of his skin for one thing, right? the tinge, and, and it's common in the 19th century to hear physical descriptions of people that, that, you know, by the later 20th century we would never talk about in these ways, but they would talk about the physiognomy of the Irish, the skin tone of the Irish, the tinge of their, the tint of their skins. Okay, so here we have the kind of racialized um, Irish emigrant, and now here we have returning triumphantly the successful uh, uh, immigrant come immigrant, and significantly this uh, uh, black figure is drawn in the background for, for whatever artistic reason we can debate, um, but I think that the black presence is something that's really important to think about in the history of the transformation uh, that various European immigrants were, were undergoing um, over time. Here again is a depiction of Uncle Sam amid the world's peoples. This was um, drawn in conjunction with the 1893 World's Fair in, in Chicago. And I don't know how well you can see this. By the way, I'm going to make these images available to you so that, um, so that you can uh, see them more closely, but also you can use them in, in your own teaching. But again, it's, it's um, Uncle Sam with, with types that we would think of as ethnic, right, in our own terminology. Um, but they're drawn racially. They're drawn as physical types in a way that their own physicality is meant to, to denote something uh, uh, about their character. This is uh, from the 1890s also. This is, I mean, this is going back to, I said that the debate that ends with the 24 legislation starts in the, in the 1890s. This is part of that debate where you really start to see, I mean, eugenic sciences are, are really beginning to to emerge as respected ways of thinking about human diversity. Uh, and the political discussion of immigration is becoming more and more uh, uh, shaped by scientific language of race and races. Um, so here's, this was, um, the caption on this was the last Yankee. And this is amid, you know, the scare that immigration has just become out of control. Too many people are arriving. Too many of the wrong people are arriving. And again, it's, so it's the last Yankee drawn amid all of these kind of racialized types. Uh, obviously, uh, the characterized um, Jewish immigrant here. Um, 
it's hard to tell what some of them are, but, um, but they're all kind of racial types um, representing different parts of Europe. This is uh, also from Harper's Weekly. It's an illustration uh, to illustrate a story about Italian immigrants. This is in, um, I think, the late 1880s, maybe uh, about 1889 or so. Um, the thing to notice here, now the, the scene that's being depicted, the boy is being beaten um, because he was working his hurdy-gurdy out on the street and he didn't bring home enough money. And so now he's being punished. But the structure of the scene, first of all, the physicality of, of the way Italians are drawn, the, the darkness of their skin, the physiognomy, the way they're cast as, as a racial type. Uh, and it's, it's the racial type that, um, explains, if you will, to a late 19th century audience, the brutality of the scene. This is how these Mediterraneans are. You know, and you can see it. You can see their character on their faces. You can see the kind of people they are by the way they look. Um, and it's not just the brutality of the father who's doing the beating, but take a look at, uh, at the hatred and the, just the, uh, the venom on the grandmother's face. Okay, you will not, I promise you, you will not find Anglo-Saxons drawn this way in 1889. This is one of my favorites. Here's Uncle Sam tending to his garden of immigrants, irrigating with free press, public school, great opportunity. There are a few negative things here too, fool fads and easy graft and kind of political corruption. But on the, on the face of it, as, as Uncle Sam tends his garden, you would think that this is a, a, an illustration that's saying something about environment and the power of environment to, uh, to shape who people are. But at the same time, I don't know how well you can see this, but the rows of immigrants, you have uh, German, Irish, Italian, I can't even read that. Uh, you're, you're right, whoops. Hungarian, Polish, different as they could be across this way, right? You're never going to mistake the German for the Irish for the Italian. Same as they could be down the rows. It's really, um, while it, it is giving you environmentalism with one hand, it's taking it away and giving you hereditarianism with the other. And it's saying something very powerful about who the different peoples of Europe are. Um, in, in order to raise the question of who might they become. And then finally, and this is, whoops, right on the cusp of that, of that uh, law in 1924 that really changes everything in European immigration, here's the popularity of Rudolf Valentino, uh, Italian immigrant, who's really trading on his capacity to be the other. Here he's playing the chic. Um, I'm pretty sure his hands are made up. I don't think he's complected quite that darkly. But in any case, it's, it's the kind of ambiguous racial type of the Italian uh, in the 19-teens and 20s that allows him to have the kind of career that he does in Hollywood, you know, playing certain kinds of villains who, who um, in, in this particular, in this particular um, film, he, he starts out as the kind of seeming Arab villain, and it turns out, oh, he's not a villain after all. He's Spanish. He's, a, he's, he's, uh, he's European, and, and the marriage can go through. Um, but it's the ambiguity of, it, of Italianness uh, in the context of, of those debates over peoplehood that I'm talking about that, that, uh, that make those kinds of texts possible, but also so compelling for audiences at the time. This is during World War II. This is from the Detroit Free Press. And depicting then that next regime that I talked about, the reconsolidation of whiteness, the refiguring of who the European peoples of the world and the European peoples of America are. It's, it's the Statue of Liberty gathering in uh, the children of Europe as my children. And now they're you know, German-American. Italian American, Irish American, but they're all drawn as cookie cutter types of the same individual. They're, they're, they're cookie cutter Europeans, 
all of those differences that were seen and scouted and feared and articulated and theorized a generation earlier have just evaporated. And, and the, the so-called races of Europe have now become the 20th century Caucasians that, that are more familiar to our thinking about race and more familiar to our, our political discussions about who's who. Um, I have more to say about this, and, and we'll build on this in certain ways in the next session, but let's, let's carve out some time just to talk about, first of all, if there are any questions in political culture. So today I want to start by thinking about diversity in general and the way that the political culture manages that. Um, and it, this will give us a way to think about the history of European immigration, which I'll, I'll go into later in this morning session. Um, but as I said, it will also give us a way to think about things that, in fact, we're often not encouraged to think about at the same time. Like, for example, immigration, slavery, conquest, the various ways that, that the peoples of North America have ended up here. So let me just start with a thumbnail sketch. I'm gonna, and and um, this is something that you already know, and I'm going to make it short and just brief. But just to remind you, and also, and I do this because... Um, in our own classrooms, both as students and now as teachers, I think we're, we often um, carve these, these uh, histories off in, and don't think of them together. Um, so the, the question is, you know, the peopling of North America, who's here, how did they get here? So as you know, and as you've covered earlier in the week, we start with the native nations, uh, hundreds scores, hundreds of, of distinct societies with their distinct religions, their distinct languages, their distinct histories um, scattered uh, across the continent. Um, the Cherokees in what's now the Southeast, the Iroquois, the Great Iroquois Nation in what's now uh, New York and Lower Canada, uh, uh, the Snoqualmies in, in the uh, Pacific Northwest, and you could go on and on, and there are hundreds, right? Those populations are soon joined by arriving Europeans, and especially the nodes of three distinct empires, and four if you want to count the Dutch. But the principal ones and the ones who, who wielded the most. I'm going to start broadly today talking about race and, and difference in general in American political culture in a way that I hope gives you a foundation for thinking about immigration specifically, but also might be a way to, to tie together some of the themes um, uh, from the entire week uh, that, that, you're, that you're managing. Um, there's a story, it's probably not true, but it's, but it's funny, of a, uh, an older Russian Jewish woman uh, disembarking at Ellis Island and uh, fresh off the boat, faced with the stern Ellis Island official bureaucrat staring over his desk at her and asking uh, in, in almost menacing tones um, as a way of testing her, and this was, was part of that initial confrontation for many people, would you ever subvert or overthrow this government by force or subversion. And she thought it over for a minute and said, subversion. <laughs> we have a really ambivalent relationship, uh, as our headlines every day will tell us, to the notion of immigration. We like to, there's a kind of romance. We like the story of being so choice worthy that the world's peoples have always wanted to come here. Uh, we've also, uh, in general, pick any period basically from the, the, the late 18th century onward, uh, we've always had this sneaking suspicion that the people who are coming ashore are about to ruin the country in one way or another. And those two things live very un uneasily side by side in America. Not just a history, but a history of histories in collision, as one, as one historian has said. So you look at this panoply of peoples in North America and the question, is how do you create a democracy, a true democracy, out of these histories in collision? If you're the founding generation, the way you do it is by beginning very, 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 very gradually, and gradually, especially by 21st century standards. So one of the first thoughtful, detailed, in-depth discussions of citizenship that took place this is the first Congress that sat down, this is 1790, when they sat down to talk about, okay, who's allowed to come to the United States? 
and, and how can they become citizens? What's the first naturalization law going to look like? The main, the most important clause in that law was free white persons. Only free white persons could come and become naturalized citizens in the new nation. Now this is a law that was in effect and on the books all the way from 1790, if you have to imagine I have a big timeline behind me because that's because I'm going to imagine that and I know it's not true, but <laughs> okay. That's a law that goes on the books in 1790, the first time Congress discusses it. Does anyone know how long the free white persons clause is on the books? That's a great guess. It, it goes, it's, it's, it's uh, revised out in 1952. Okay, that's a very long time. My parents were married in 1950. <laughs> so, power over time, uh, the, British, the British Empire and what's now the Northeast and the Eastern Seaboard, uh, the French Empire uh, in what's now Canada and all the way across to the great French city of Detroit, um, which is now the upper Midwest, and down the Mississippi through the, the center of the continent uh, to uh, New Orleans. And the Spanish Empire, both in what's now the, the U.S. Southeast and the Southwest. As you know, some of those European arrivals brought with them slaves from Africa or, or began importing slaves from Africa. So then again, whole new population introduced, and again, on very different terms than either of the, the two populations that I've discussed so far. Then, as the, the British Empire begins to win the day, uh, and, and British political culture uh, begins to be the predominant political culture on the continent. You have the, the westward expansion uh, and an Anglo uh, uh, political culture that, that uh, gradually uh, moves across the continent. And so um, more and more populations brought in through histories of conquest and inclusion um, and dispossession often as well, including you know, the, the huge populations, indigenous populations and former uh, Mexican uh, populations of what's now the, the Southwest and the Far West uh, in the United States. Then you have varying degrees of voluntary migration beginning mostly from Europe. Uh, people coming in uh, as indentured servants um, and also people coming in in, in much greater uh, varieties of freedom or total liberty, but no nonetheless voluntary migrants um, who come in the greatest numbers. And the first massive wave is really the Irish, um, although there had obviously been a lot of, of European immigrants before the, the massive wave of the Irish. Uh, and then increasingly coming from other, other parts of Europe and increasingly further south and further east in Europe as you get deeper into the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century. And then, finally, one last group of voluntary migrants, but voluntary migrants who come in on very different terms than the Europeans, and that is uh, Asian immigrants. First from China in the mid-century, followed by the Japanese, and immigrants from, uh, from uh, South and East Asia. And I say coming in on different terms, and this is something I'll get into in more detail in a minute. For the most part, these were voluntary migrants as well but they were not eligible to become citizens in the way that European immigrants were. In fact, they were completely ineligible for citizenship, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. Okay, this, this you all know. You know that these people are here. What we tend not to think about so much, we talk about diversity, we talk about distinct religions or cultures or languages, we don't tend to talk so much about the diversity of standing. How did people get here? What is their legal standing in what became the United States? What is their relationship? What is our relationship to the idea of America, to uh, uh, America as a state, to America as a nation, to America as, uh, as a, a country with, with uh, 